for attending. We will start with the Pledge of Allegiance, so if you want to stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we continue, I'd like to know if there's any other elected officials in the office, in the office. In the room, please stand and just briefly uh, give your name and what your position is. <laughs> Lake County Commissioner, uh, position number one. Dan Shan, Lake County Commissioner, position two. Tim Chester, Lake County Commissioner, number three, obviously. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And we do have one appointed yeah, town council member. Council, council member. <coughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, with that, I'd just like to introduce Senator Merkley. During his service as state representative and as our Oregon Senator, Jeff Merkley has emphasized fighting for the success of Oregon's working families. That means fighting for good paying jobs, strong public schools, and affordable <coughs> college and health care. In the Senate, Jeff took on Wall Street, winning passage of key provisions known as the Volco, Volco, Volco Rule, to shut down the Wall Street casino that devastated America's working families in 2008. He led the successful fight to end predatory mortgage loans and create a consumer cop on the beat, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, to block the reemergence of deceptive wealth, excuse me, um, stripping financial practices. He has also championed many other issues important to our state including our farmers to drive their farm trucks across state lines, designating the framework for our small businesses to raise capital through crowdfunding, and leading the effort to bring our sons and daughters home from Afghanistan. He is also the Senate leader in fixing the filibuster and restoring our broken Senate so it can take on the big issues facing America. Jeff is a native Oregonian and the son of a millwright. He was born in Myrtle Creek, Oregon, and his family moved with the timber economy to Roseburg and then to East Multnomah County. He was elected to the Oregon House of Representatives in 1998. In, 19, in 2007, he became Speaker of the Oregon House and held that post until his election to the U.S. Senate. He began his involvement in policy as an intern for Oregon Senate Senator Mac, Mark Hatfield, and in 2009, he was sworn into the same Senate seat once held by Mark Hatfield. Jeff holds an open town meeting in every Oregon County every year. So please welcome our Senator, Jeff Berkeley. Uh, thank you so much, Mayor, for kicking this off. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, it's, um, uh, pleasure to be here, and this is the uh, now the eighth town hall I've held in the, in the county, and we continue to wrestle with uh, uh, many of the, the same issues, but uh, some have progress here and there, other new things emerge, and so it's just helpful to keep coming back and keep hearing about the, uh, the, the concerns uh, that folks have. Uh, there are basically are very few centers that hold town halls. Uh, Senator Wyden set the model here in Oregon, and I followed that example. And I really can't envision how I could possibly uh, do the job without the type of feedback that is provided through this uh, direct kind of conversation. So thank you for being engaged citizens and, and for participating. At each town hall, I like to put a spotlight on, on some uh, activity within the county that is a, a bright point that's uh, contributing to the success of the community. And so uh, today, I'd like to invite uh, Rob Nichols to come up and join us. Rob, welcome. And this is specifically in regard to the Lakeview Partnership Committee, uh, which was uh, formed with the mission of building community pride and by creating a vibrant and attractive downtown, downtown by celebrating the history of the area and connecting to the area's amazing natural amenities. And uh, congratulations on the grant you received from the Reeser uh, Foundation. Uh, the uh, historic photo project that uh, tried to uh, help connect the, the annual fair, if you will, to the down, downtown. 
and uh, the renovation already of a couple buildings on Main Street. Main Street. So, uh, if you haven't existed for one, we want to come and share a couple comments about uh, what you're all up to, and if you're soliciting extra volunteers or donations, feel feel free to. Use them all. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, There's a lot of other people here that help form a nonprofit corporation um, to promote um, the town of Lakeview. But I think when we picked our name, it's Lakeview Community. So it's, it starts at the town, but um, really it's a community. It's all of um, South Lake County and all of Lake County, really. And, so, and the nice thing about it, it's a nonprofit. And um, um, the model that we have followed is. Um, um, the downtown re re renovation projects that are there, and so we've started on. We've only been in place for about a, six months, and so we've already got some progress, and um, we're pretty excited about where we're going. There seems to be a lot of enthusiasm. Um, last year, I, maybe when you were here, we renovated our, our swim pool here at the cost of several hundred thousand dollars with the help of the state of Oregon, and I feel like that same um, excitement is here um, with regard to the downtown area right now. And so that's why we formed the 501c3 corporation. And Senator, you can certainly make a donation. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be glad to. I'll be glad to do it. And so, but the idea is, like many rural communities, and I'm so glad that you came. Is there some? Many of us are struggling. And there is a lot of economic opportunity here, and we're going to make sure that people know that and um, try to get things back on track. So that's what, I, that's what we're trying to do. Well, in recognition of uh, this, this effort, uh, many successes already in this short time, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the certificate of, uh, of uh, recognition. Oh, well, it's not to me, but yeah, there you go. It's the Lakeview Community <laughs> Partnership. Very good. And more substantially for the use, however, uh, it best fits uh, your, your organization uh, by the form of the U.S. Capitol. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. For well, thank you very much. Thanks for recognizing us, and thanks for, um, there's lots of other good people that are deserving, but thank you for us. And we're just trying to get our name out there, and thank you for coming down. Thank you. I thought I'd share just a couple of comments about some of the uh, substantial issues that are being uh, discussed uh, as you think about things you would like to, to raise. Uh, and then uh, we're going to have the, the mayor has agreed to uh, pull the, the, the tickets. Uh, mayor is now seated where? <laughs> there you are. There you are. Okay. And you already have the, we have the tickets in your hands? Okay, we, we uh, will also uh, make a couple comments. Uh, uh, we'll have a, a student who's agreed to ask the uh, first question and uh, uh, kick off the, the, the conversation. I want to mention that, that we just passed the uh, Every Child Succeeds Act. Uh, since uh, before I ran for office, uh, communities in Oregon have been saying we really the, the no child left behind is not working. It's uh, overly impressive on the on the states. Doesn't involve enough flexibility. Uh, actually leaves a lot of children behind because it forces teachers to focus on the children who are just below the testing bar to get them over, so less attention to those who might have further to go or those who would already meet the test. Uh, lots of requirements that require school districts to spend money in the wrong places. Uh, testing that took up too much time, a whole list of things. The, the bill that has just passed, I think, addresses most of those issues, gives a lot more flexibility uh, back to the states on, on policy. An educator was telling me at a, at a previous town hall yesterday that now we have to figure out how Oregon wants to do testing because it's not mandated uh, nationally. I'm like, well, that's the, that's the other side of it, right? You have more flexibility, and uh, so Oregon will have to uh, go through some adjustments figuring that, uh, that out. Uh, second, uh, we have a long-term transportation bill that just passed. Should I be using this microphone? Raise your hands if I start speaking too softly. But, uh, the, um, uh, we have gone through more than a dozen short-term extensions, so finally we have a multi-year transportation bill dedicated to infrastructure, <coughs> bridges, roads, jetties, and, and so forth. Uh, it's, it's not it, it's a bill that has plenty of things that, that uh, in terms of the way it's funded that I don't like, but, the, but in the big picture, 
it's so important for a democracy to have a long-term commitment to the infrastructure. Uh, our parents' generation had that commitment. We've, we've certainly had the national highway system since Eisenhower. And uh, we, the fact that there hasn't been long-term reliability of a federal partner has hurt projects here in Oregon. So I think that that's a, uh, a move uh, forward. Uh, I wanted to mention on uh, fire funding, uh, we've been pursuing a model that would look a lot more like FEMA, so the national government would operate more the way they operate in regards to earthquakes and, and hurricanes. Uh, we didn't get to that model, but we did get halfway there. Uh, we got a, a partnership across the aisle uh, and proceeded to get uh, funding that is equal to 100% of the average in the last 10 years for fighting fires. The whole goal is to end fire borrowing. We also got a reserve fund of $600 million that will be on a kind of a revolving basis uh, so that if we go over that average, hopefully we won't end up in a fire borrowing situation. Uh, really terrible fire year, it could still happen, uh, but we're about halfway to the FEMA structure that doesn't have a cap on it in regards to uh, uh, response to earthquakes or, or uh, hurricanes. There's a lot more issues I can mention, but rather than doing that, let's go ahead and get into the uh, conversation. Is somebody speaking that you just passionately disagree with? Uh, please still give that person the respect and an opportunity to make their case, and then when it's your turn, we'll ask everyone to be equally respectful so you can uh, make your points. <coughs> Our student, Ezekiah, Ezekiah is great. In back, uh, Ezekiah, is it Haven or Haven? Ezekiah Haven. Haven. Yeah. Uh, Ezekiah is at Lakeview as a, a senior, and uh, you're thinking, I believe, about going to Oregon State University next year? Uh, yes, that's right. And perhaps uh, political science. Uh, yeah, probably. Or constitutional law. I'm not no. Sure. Or constitutional. Uh, constitutional law. I'm not. Constitutional law. I had no idea what I was going to do when I went to college. So uh, you have at least the starting point to think about how to. I remember sitting down. Of course, it was before things were online, and uh, there was on, on the in the dorm room was a inch thick book of courses, and I just sat there going paging through going, what am I, what, what class am I going to take? It was, uh, anyway, uh, I'm glad you're on, on course there, and as a kind, do you have a question or comment you want to um, share with Yeah, folks? I was wondering, um, why don't you go ahead and stand up and give them a little Would you stuff. consider the recent takeover of the Mount Here National Wildlife Refuge an act of domestic terrorism or a radical expression of first amendment rights? I'll tell you, I think the, um, the comment made by, by Sheriff Ward there kind of summarized how I feel about it. He said, uh, if you say you came here uh, to support the community, then uh, the best way you can support the community is to go home. And uh, I've heard a number of uh, public officials kind of uh, echo that, that theme. As to the, uh, the sentence uh, that uh, exists for the Hammonds, that's a very unfortunate situation where they were sentenced, they served time, they were out, uh, and then under a mandatory sentencing law, the court said, no, it's a mandatory sentencing law, you have to serve a mandatory sentence. I think what this should make us all very aware of is what happens with the, because there's been a, you know, there's been a big push uh, over the last uh, decade and a half for mandatory sentencing. It takes the judgment out of the judicial process. I went back and looked at the law, and it says any destruction of federal property. I said to my team, does this mean that if you destroy a chair on federal property, the, the mandatory sentence is five years? Yes. Uh, so uh, I think that that actually must be looked at by, by, by Congress. And we need to think very carefully at the state level and federal level when we do mandatories because uh, the reason you have a judge is to be able to evaluate the circumstances. You can't do that. The court has reinforced that on appeal, said, nope, sorry, if, if the law says it's mandatory, it's mandatory. You're judge. You don't get to, to reduce the sentence. So I think we should all take a look at that very Okay, uh, Mayor. Just the last three numbers. Okay, number six two four. That's the last three numbers. The last three numbers on your red card. Just go ahead and read several, and and uh, okay. if we don't have to go in the exact order. And maybe if you could share a, a what number you have, she can retire it, and uh, second the name and what part of the county might. 622. 
Okay. Do you want to ask a question? Sure. Okay. Hi, Senator. Hey. I'm, I'm Jennifer Turner, and we work for Central Oregon Intergovernmental Council, and we administer your Workforce Investment Act funds and run an alternative school. So a bunch of our students oh, are joining me today. Great. So we mostly came just to see you and be a part of the process. But I would, I would love to hear anything that you see. We know that we're sector-based now in our workforce investment fund monies. And you know our sectors here involve mining and lumber and agriculture. And just any thoughts that you had about what you see on the, coming down the pike or anything that Lake County could benefit from or watch out for? Well, one of the things that I pushed for in the Every Child Succeeds Act was flexible funding for, for STEM and for career technical education. And the um, uh, STEM is the science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Uh, there's a lot of professions now that uh, require that type of background. And there's uh, uh, rob robotics activities that, that are very enriching. I was very struck. Uh, uh, and is there a robotics team here? All right. Teacher is Fred Smith here? I'm sorry, <laughs> I thought no. he was here. No, no uh, but we do have a teacher at Lakeview High School, very involved in the STEM program. That is great. Robotics I guy. wish there had, yeah. that had been in, in the high school. My children just graduated from high school, uh, but unfortunately, they didn't have a STEM uh, STEM program. Uh, the CTE side, career technical education, is uh, to, to translate. That's the, the current term of art for shop classes, which were really wiped out by No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind, left those behind. so we're trying to reinvigorate those. Those can be customized to, to what a high school feels is and a, and a middle school feel are are relevant to a particular area, uh, and uh, so that's probably the main development that complements the workforce investment. Act. Okay. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Six one six. Five eight nine. Five eight six. Six one one. We have a lot of shy people. <laughs> six zero eight. Five nine six. So I have a question about this new gas station thing they're talking about. They're talking about making it so you can self pump. Do you think that'll affect Oregon jobs for get working at gas stations? Uh, so um, unfortunately, we don't have a state legislator here, uh, and this was a change in state law. Uh, the um, so I don't know the details of that law well, but essentially, uh, it created um, a different structure for rural areas. So where you have, uh, in urban areas, you might have 24-hour stations. You know, it may not have that in rural areas. So the idea is people should always be able to access gasoline. Uh, I think it had particular hours on it. Uh, is that, I'm seeing a shaking head from, you know, what is it, uh, 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. or something? 6 p.m. 6 p.m. I was working a, a, a job once, um, and I drove a, uh, uh, so I drove a flatbed truck down with a, a, a transmission for a, a dam project uh, and spent the night uh, as a mechanics assistant putting it in, got back to um, uh, the I-5 down in Southern Oregon <coughs> about 4 in the morning, and I had to sit there for several hours and wait for the gas station to open. And it sits in my mind thinking about uh, what the state legislature was doing. Uh, I don't know if it will have an impact on the rural jobs since it's just the hours that a lot of stations were often closed anyway. I, I doubt that it would have a significant impact, but again, uh, because that was the state legislature, and I wasn't involved directly in the conversations. I don't have more insight. Does anybody want to add anything on that? Uh, let me, let's just do this. How many people like the new gas flexibility <coughs> law that the state legislature passed? How many folks don't like that? Yes, no. Normally, when I, when I was a state legislator, uh, we looked at this several times uh, in terms of just a statewide policy. And what I really heard from were seniors who didn't want to get out of their cars and and, and either they had difficulty walking or, or didn't want to deal with gasoline. And, uh, and so this is a little bit, this is a compromise trying to be crafted for different parts of the state. I'd like to add, you asked if you wanted anything to add, just this morning, you know, motorist services up 120 miles north of Christmas Valley. We don't get air, we don't get water, and I'd like to see something amended to, your leg to this legislation. I would say if you're providing motorist fuels, you need to provide motorist services, i.e. water and air for tires. 
You, uh, 50 cents, whatever it is, the, the hardware store is what provides the air. And it, it's Remember, crazy. Uh, 30 years That's ago, there would be a hose in every yeah. island yes. that you could fill up with while you were getting your gas down. So that's a frustration throughout the state. It's, uh, I did just, uh, so uh, uh, last week, uh, Mary and I were uh, filling up our tires, and the place we normally go, uh, the machine was broken. And so we went through a bunch of stations that didn't have it, and we finally found one that did, and actually operated on a credit card. And I was so thankful. Because <laughs> I could do it without quarters, which I didn't. I didn't yeah, <laughs> the station was closed. So maybe, maybe more of those will start materializing. Ah, uh, yeah, I'd love to see that. <coughs> Six, one, two. Five, nine, eight. That would be me. <laughs> Thanks for coming. And uh, I, if anyone that was here when Ron Wyden came, this is quite a different turnout. Uh, you know, a lot more people here. I'm not sure if summertime on Saturday is better or snowing in the winter. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure what the difference is. It's professional hour, but. Uh, he had stated he'd done over 700 town halls, and I hope you continue that tradition. Yeah, he's about 500 ahead of me, so I will... Right, no, I, yeah, I realize that. He's a junior senator, but... but... This is my 256th town hall, so I'm, I'm working on it. Five, six. Uh, I guess I'm going to... Because of the number of people here and questions, I'm going to cut it down. I've been taking notes. Yeah, pick, pick your uh, top question so that we give everyone else a chance. Hey. Uh, if I can go two part, because they kind of tie in together, you've already talked about um, infrastructure pop projects, and the mayor introduced you as a you know the the consumer on the beat. I mean the the, the reform for finance reform. On you were on the beat with your legislation. I want to know your standing of legislation regarding Glass Steagall, because Senator Wyden, being the senior senator. Did not have a position. I'm quite surprised about that. Hillary Clinton came out and said, no, Dodd-Frank. Um, the second part is, what's your position on this TPP now that the text has been released? And do you really think that Ron has, or Senator Wyden has worked out the details to a point where the people are actually not getting the short end of the stick? So, uh, yeah, I'll share my, my comments specifically about TPP and uh, also about uh, Glass-Steagall. So, uh, the thing that I undertook when I was first elected was taking on the Wall Street casino, which is the derivatives sold by the big banks. This is known as the Volcker Rule, which is unfortunate in that it sounds like a fancy accounting term, but it essentially says the banks that they can't use uh, deposit, deposits from all of us to gamble on high-risk derivatives. And so uh, uh, that bill, people said there's no chance of getting this passed. and. I thought, how strange is it that uh, a new senator from Oregon is taking on Wall Street? It's not like I have a background in, in high finance. But my team came to me and, um, and laid out the, the, why this was such a key part of the meltdown in 2008. And having these big banks just gamble in this fashion is just a, uh, there should be taking our deposits and making loans instead of uh, shipping the funds overseas and doing all kinds of different high-risk ventures. Agreed. So we shut that down. They had the uh, that was successful. Uh, yeah, I'd like to tell you longer stories about it. They had many chapters, and I, it was dead uh, a dozen times, but it, it kept resurrecting it. We finally won in the end. That is essentially the heart of the goal of Glass Steagall. Now Glass Steagall had crisper boundaries, and I am still looking at the possibility of, of backing Glass Steagall. Let me give you an example. Under the Volcker rule, which shuts down the investments in derivatives, it still allows the big banks to do market making, and it still allows them to do investment fund management. And if I would, may, on market making, we also on C-SPAN testimony from Goldman Sachs. These guys were 33, 35, 38, and they were referred to by the gray hair, silver held men as the experts in market making and derivative swaps. Yeah. So if you, if you think of market making, I mean, that's, that's, think of bread. You have a bread factory uh, and a, maybe a warehouse full of bread, and then you have a retail store. So the Volcker rule shut down the investment in the warehouse, but allowed them to still put loaves of bread on to match up a derivative with a specific customer. So that's the market making. 
So, but the problem, the reason that, that it is not a, a clean line is drawing a line between retail, <coughs> single loaves of bread, and warehouses is not as easy as you might think. So that's the challenge for the regulators. Uh, so that's why I'm still looking at the VOCA rule and considering, <coughs> uh, excuse me, the Glass-Steagall and considering sponsoring it, it has much more crisp boundaries in terms of the regulations that it uh, applies between investment banking and commercial banking. And if I may close comment for educational purposes, that it had been in place since 1933. It was kind of shot down with Reaganomics, but totally killed under Clinton. And nine years later, everything collapsed. It was successful for 50 years. Hope, hopes, folks, uh, look at it for yourselves and decide for yourselves what it is. We can comment with the senator's office. Uh, the second Thank you. PP, let me share my uh, thought on that, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, how many folks have heard of the TPP? How many folks are largely supportive of, of it uh, being implemented? How many folks are uh, very concerned about its implementation? Uh, that's pretty much the ratio that I've had my my town halls. Uh, it varies from area to area. It is, I think it's probably likely that there will be some non-tariff barriers that other nations have put on our agricultural exports that will get struck down that will help some of our agricultural uh, sector. But my big concern about the TPP is it puts our <coughs> manufacturing in direct competition with manufacturing in nations where the workers are paid less than a dollar an hour. It brings in two new, very poor nations, Vietnam and Malaysia. Uh, Vietnam pays, uh, it's, their minimum wage varies by, by county, if you will, the equivalent of their counties, but it's, it's generally uh, 60 to 70 cents an hour. Uh, Malaysia, uh, very low wages and is, is a major trafficker uh, in uh, human labor, so it kind of have almost the equivalent of slave labor, uh, very, very low human rights rate, rating. The State Department actually increased or improved their rating on the basis of promises that they're making to improve it so that they can participate in TPP. If you have a situation where you have a country with low environmental laws and very low wages, uh, then you are going to have manufacturers go to that nation to make stuff that's just a lot cheaper. They want to be able, the international, multinationals want to be able to sell at the world price and make their stuff at the lowest cost place in the world. And that's what the TPP facilitates. What it means is a sucking of jobs manufacturing jobs out of our economy. It means a crushing impact on the world class here in America. Uh, so um, those, those were the, uh, I have many concerns that didn't address uh, 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 the manipulation of currency markets, which is a way that basically China has put a tariff on our products and a subsidy on theirs. Now China's not party to this, uh, but they could be, because they could dock with it in the future without any future review by, by Congress. Uh, so uh, I uh, believe that um, some of our earlier trade agreements have had a decimating impact on the middle class in America. If you want a big picture, the three decades after World War II, middle class surged in America. And essentially during that period, we were largely looking at expanding trade with nations that looked a lot like ours in terms of uh, environmental and labor laws. And then we had a growth in massive imports, Japan first, and then China. And then you see from the mid-70s, when I came out of high school till now, we've had four decades of flat to declining middle class. And uh, so uh, uh, yeah, you can gather from that, I'll be opposing uh, implementation of the, of the TPP. 606. Zero one. No. Yes. Senator uh, Gerald Stewart, Lake County native. What can you do to help us with uh, the Red Rock biofuel plant that is proposed that would uh, help us create jobs and also help us with our forest health? Uh, so, just to back up a little bit, since I was elected, I've been working with the EPA to get them to change how they view biomass, because they viewed it just as the point of burning rather than the life cycle impacts on carbon, so try to you know, kind of embrace the uh, near carbon neutrality 
of um, a lot of biomass operations. That's particularly true when you're talking about the by byproducts of forest thinning, forest health, stuff that we're otherwise putting in heaps in the forest and, and burning. And so uh, the, the key question is whether the uh, biomass collected can qualify and operated can qualify for uh, tax credits related to biomass. So that's, that's the point I'm really focusing on, which would have a big help to this project. Thank you. <laughs> 599, 615, 619. I asked this question for a <coughs> Is there any chance that there will be any legislation on campaign life, uh, finance reform? Uh, could you hear a question? Any, any possibility of legislation on campaign finance reform? Very little. Do you want me to expand on them? <laughs> so here's, here's the situation we have. Uh, we have uh, massive investment campaigns by third party special interests. And they don't put the money into the campaign directly. They often run a third party campaign. It's all negative attack ads. It's very, very vicious uh, stuff. Uh, and it normally is way off track in terms of accuracy. Uh, so that's what we have to contend with, the airwaves, the television commercials get inundated with these third-party ads. Uh, we had here in Oregon, when I was running last year, the Koch brothers came and on the web and on uh, television in some of the markets around the state. Uh, they invested many millions of dollars in, uh, in pretty brutal uh, attack ads. Uh, the, um, um, I wasn't able to respond because I could not afford in the month of August, in July and August, uh, to spend any money on, on rebutting what they're doing. And I, if uh, some of you will remember, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali developed this strategy that he called rope And he'd go a round or two, and, and he's, the, the guy he's boxing would just be slugging him, just like, and he'd be going, he'd be leaning back on the ropes, kind of defending himself, just out of out of reach his face, but he'd take a lot of body blows, and he, and he just chose not to respond. Well, I, I would have responded if I had the resources, but I didn't. So I, I felt I just had to take those blows week after week after week until after Labor Day when I was able to go on the air. And when I went on, on the air, I directly attacked the folks who were funding this campaign to educate Oregonians about where that money was coming from, who they were, why they'd come to Oregon, and a month later they left the state. Uh, now that's one of the very few states where a candidate took them on directly, and it's only one of two states where they withdrew before the November election. And uh, if the challenge is it takes away from everything else to try to educate people about where this money is coming from, what their interests are, and, and so forth. So uh, I'm very concerned about the third party expenditures. This has really opened up by the Citizens United uh, legislation. Basically the judges said, there's a 5-4 decision they said, uh, unlimited spending on campaigns is, is not a corrosive or corrupting force on American elections. <laughs> well, yes, it is a corrosive and corrupting force. Uh, the, um, then, very interestingly, they had a case involving judicial elections. And they said, oh, well, judges, you can have a law that says judges cannot collect <coughs> campaign donations even though they spend themselves and take responsibility for it because that money would be a corrosive and corrupting influence on judicial elections. And so they understood the impact of money in judicial elections, but, but not these third party expenditures in legislative elections. Uh, so uh, I'm hoping, that there was an interesting follow-up case where Montana said, hey, uh, take our case, because here in Montana 100 years ago, we were owned by King Cop Copper, we basically controlled every election in the state, and then our legislature, to free ourselves from that grip, outlawed uh, the campaign donations, and we maintained <coughs> our democracy. We, so if you want to see corrosion and corruption, look to the history of Montana, and um, the Supreme Court, uh, the five, five vote majority said they would not take the case. So they did not look at uh, Montana's experience. I'm hoping we continue to, to press with this. Meanwhile, uh, I think the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, that regulates uh, uh, public companies for <coughs> the owners of the company should be able to know how that company is spending money on political activities, on uh, donations, uh, uh, campaign ads, um, on lobbying. 
Uh, and I think that's a, a relevant thing for anyone who uh, chooses to invest in a corporation is to be able to have that, that knowledge. That's something they could do tomorrow. Uh, the chair has not wanted to do it. Uh, I had lobbied them to put it on the rulemaking agenda, they put it on, and they got pushed by the same special interests that do those third party campaigns, they took it off. They recently mentioned that they might consider putting it back on, and in this massive bill uh, that was uh, just passed by Congress, this 2,000 page bill, a bill they did not vote for, it has a provision in it uh, which now bans the SEC from, from making such a rule. So even, the, even public disclosure is, is, is so. Uh, it's uh, that's where we stand. Five eight six. Five eight seven. Six zero three. That's me. <laughs> Bob Carlin from Paisley. Uh, Gerald just asked you a question about what you can do to help Red Rock and stuff. I wonder what you can do to help the companies that are already here struggling to survive. We just went through a two-month shutdown of the sawmill. I think uh, they need as much attention as anything else, and I'm just wondering what you can do. Yes. Uh, the, um, and I think we have the uh, Colin Smokes uh, here. Uh, the, um, we have, we have a history going back five decades now, just mill after mill shutting down as, as part of it, mechanization, but a lot of it, the change in public force. Uh, and the other thing is, is we are producing an enormous amount of timber that we do not go to, that doesn't go to our sawmills, it goes overseas, it goes to China. There was, uh, at the time that I was growing up, there was a provision uh, that said, if you ship your logs overseas, you can't access public logs. That was a pretty powerful incentive for folks to process their logs in Oregon mills. But that was when companies were more vertically integrated, and a lot of companies are now just on forest land. They don't own mills, uh, so they're selling it to just the highest bidder, and that happens to be China at this point. I don't know if you've seen the log decks over on the coast on the Columbia River. I've never seen log decks like that in my, my, my life. So how do we get those logs processed in our mills, making it affordable? And um, uh, the Collins representatives were, were talking about, uh, uh, really at the meeting I held before, about a, a provision that I'm going to be taking a look at that helps make the logs affordable that are harvested in the local area to a, a local mill. So that may be uh, one possibility. But another is, is there any way to create federal or state incentives so that we're not a third world country shipping our logs overseas, that we're processing them? here in our, in our mills in the, in the state. And that put a lot more people to, to work and allow us to add the value, uh, to have a, more value out of our, our timber products. I think it has to be a carrot, it has to be a financial incentive, uh, and uh, uh, how, we, you know, how we do that. I don't know the answer, but I'm asking the question of, of experts. Is there any way for us to uh, see a lot more of those early log process? And feel free to come to me with other ideas and thoughts. I'm not on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, which is the lead on, if you will, forest policy. Uh, I'm Senator White is, uh, but I'm very much engaged in the conversation. So happy to hear thoughts and details. And I should introduce Amy on my team. Uh, Amy Amrai. Uh, uh, she has <coughs> cards, uh, she's on the website, uh, she's my field rep, and she can put you in contact with any of my team members or she can get me on the phone. 597. 582. Good evening. Uh, Senator, my name is uh, Fred Stupak. I'm a fellow district. Thank you for bringing your students. We talked about this in, in class, and I'm going to reiterate a statement uh, I made to them. We were talking about ISIS. Yeah. I never served in the military, so it's always hard for me to say we should send groups uh, or send troops in to fight. <coughs> this is a uh, fluid situation with a presidential campaign going on. Uh, but my two questions are, one, how do we go about fighting a group like ISIS? And two, how do we prevent a power vacuum situation like we had in Afghanistan in the 80s and Iraq in the 90s that lead to Al-Qaeda and ISIS now? Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, so uh, uh, I'm going to create a pretend map in the air here uh, to just kind of frame the conversation. Uh, here you have Saudi Arabia. Uh, they are a Sunni Islam nation. Uh, over here on the yeah, eastern end of the Middle East, you have Iran. Uh, it is not an Arab nation, it's a Persian nation, and it's Shiite Islam. And uh, now for, I think, 1,400 years it is, the Shiites and the Sunnis have been fighting each other. They have a fundamentally incompatible vision of uh, how Islam should be practiced uh, on, our, on, our, on our planet. Uh, and it's reinforced also by these ethnic divisions. So you have these two major powers, and the Middle East is full of Shiite and, and Sunni enclaves. They're battling each other. So you have now these proxy wars, if you will. And those wars are going to be much more intense in a situation where there's the vacuum that you've described. Uh, the United States created that vacuum in Iraq by, by taking out the you know, dictator, and uh, the, um, we helped set up a uh, parliamentary system there that has been completely unsuccessful. I think about how paralyzed the U.S. Senate is after 30 <coughs> years of practice, and I think, how did we ever think that this was going to, to work? And it, it hasn't. Uh, you also have Iraq divided by the Kurdish, the Kurds, the Shiites, and the Sunnis. Now, okay, that's the framework. Saudi Arabia, Sunni, you know, Iran, Shiite, both powerful <coughs> nations, lots of proxy wars, Proxy war in Syria, which is another power vacuum from the Civil War. Proxy war in Yemen, uh, which is uh, facing uh, substantial clashes. So how does ISIS fit into that? So the folks who became the monarchy in Saudi Arabia, uh, they had a philosophy of absolute purity regarding a certain code, and anyone who disagreed with them, they killed. And uh, they became, eventually, those who ruled Saudi Arabia. ISIS philosophy is also Sunni, and they, they basically carry the same philosophy that took the Saudis into power long ago, but they are at a different stage. They're, no, they're not the rulers yet, they're the insurgents. And they want to set up a kingdom just like those did who ruled Saudi Arabia. So you have a, a Sunni force. Now, this Sunni force, it's theological. You can win a battle but you aren't going to stamp out the ideology behind it. This is deeply rooted hundreds and hundreds of years, 1,400 years uh, here. So that kind of sets the context for a very complicated, messy situation. What's different now? Well, one, you have these two vacuums in, in Iraq, in Syria. Second of all, you have modern weapons. So it's very different when people have the type of weapons that they have access to, to, to now. Uh, they can do a lot more destruction. We should be very, very careful about putting troops on the ground. Uh, very, uh, and I'll tell you why, what ISIS wants is for us to put troops on the ground. They want to frame their battle as one, one for their vision of the Sunni theology, but second of all, as a war with America. They want to have people from outside the Arab world, outside the Muslim world, coming and be on the ground. That's their best motivator, their best recruitment tool. So they, we should not fall into the trap of facilitating their, their strategy. This is why I criticized uh, 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 Trump for basically uh, saying, framing what we're involved as a war against Islam. That's exactly what ISIS uh, desires. The, um, the ways to take this on, uh, one is you cut off their financing. So we've got to shut down. They are using uh, oil trucks and they're, they're, they're uh, exporting oil. We've got to shut that down. And we've started to do so. Second is you have to, to cut off their, their lines of supply. There are stretches where cities are isolated, long lines of supply. We've done a fair amount of that. That's a piece that we can do with air power. But troops on the ground should come from the other Islamic nations that have an interest in ending the, the instability here. And Saudi Arabia is a major force that has an interest in this because this brush fire, if you will, of ISIS, I don't mean to diminish it, but in terms of the power of Saudi Arabia, they're like, well, that's over there. But Saudi Arabia has actually been facilitating that brush fire by providing funding. Uh, a lot of funding goes out of Saudi Arabia to Al-Qaeda, a lot of funding goes out towards ISIS, because they've been kind of been involved in a compromise where they say, don't mess with us at home, we'll help you 
over there. Well, so we've got to, to be much, much stronger with Saudi Arabia in terms of cutting out financing. Uh, so on the oil financing, the supply financing, uh, it needs to be Arab troops on the ground, uh, and uh, those are the, and then the Kurds. The Kurds are the single most effective force. It's been difficult to get support to them because we've tried to do it through the Baghdad government. Baghdad government doesn't want um, uh, armaments to go to the Kurds because the Kurds are autonomous and they feel it disrupts their national identity and Shiite control. Uh, but really, they, we have to find a way to get to reinforce their ability because they are the ones that they are they are the determined, capable, professional fighting force that has been knocking ISIS back. The actual area they occupy has shrunk considerably over the last year, so it's, it's, we're not involved. In, a year later, the kind of the the tide has been stemmed, but the theology will keep erupting in various places, and it shouldn't. Every time it erupts, shouldn't be we send troops on the on the, on the ground. This is again 1,400 year old battles between two conflicting theologies, and they would like nothing better than to have American troops there, and I think that's not in our interest. That's a tough situation. Saudi Arabia is one of our key allies in the, in the Middle East. Uh, Very tough. Allies. <laughs> you, you can understand why we've been reluctant to pressure them in this regard. Thank you. But we at least need to be pressuring them in, in back channels, if not embarrassing them publicly about it. We have time for one more question. <coughs> so six, two, three. And then after that question, we'll have a question from a, a student to close out our, our gathering. Five, eight, four. Five, eight, three. Apparently, the two party system was founded way back then, but uh, partisan primary elections are illegal. It uh, deprives half of the voters. Either way, in essence, it, it deprives all voters of their right to vote for any candidate that's, that's running for an office. How can it be illegal to not be able to vote across party lines in the primary, but then you can vote across party lines in the general election? Uh, could you all hear the question? Okay. Uh, so, um, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I, I think I, I think I have the, the, the more or less the framework of, of uh, response for you, uh, but I may have to consult and get back in contact with you. So I'll have Amy get your information. But uh, first of all, I disagree with your initial premise that, that primary elections are illegal. Uh, the uh, essentially it's a freedom of association. And if you think originally the founders did not want parties to develop, they said this, this would be counterproductive. But then you have, like, let's say we're all the kind of initial folks gathered together. There are 26 senators uh, in the initial Senate. And I see, well, I've got 10 people over here who kind of agree with what we should do regarding setting up the national treasury. Uh, there's a Alexander Hamilton or so on and so forth. And so they get together with that group and say, how can we make this happen? And they're like, well, we share, we share, a, we share a viewpoint. Uh, we should work together to, to nominate somebody to run for the presidency. Well, you can see it's a natural freedom of association evolution, the creation of parties, and they're like, well, let's, let's meet at the such and such hall and let's hold an election uh, among ourselves about who we'll put up for a, a nominee. So it's, uh, it's kind of a natural instinct uh, to uh, form alliances with people of, of like mind. And um, nothing stops anyone else from running outside that alliance, uh, which is the general election. Uh, so that's the, kind of the, the history of the evolution of the, the parties. The party structure has changed over time. We, the Whigs collapsed, uh, the uh, Republicans emerged, or so on and so forth. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and over time, there sometimes the, 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 the two parties have kind of rotated. You get enough decades apart. A party that had a strong position here ends up over here. Five decades later, other parties in the other spot. So um, they continually evolve to the issues uh, facing uh, America.
And uh, so that's that's the basic background to it. I'm happy to get more details if you want me to follow up more. In, in 2012, there was one position of the county commissioners up for re-election. Two people run for that position, and they were both from the same party. So that meant half of the people in Lake County had no voice as who would represent them for the next four years. Well, so let me put it this way. Uh, the other party could have gotten together and put up a candidate, and so they had a voice, they didn't exercise it. Okay, but they didn't do that. Well, they didn't, right. <laughs> so that, that still deprives half of the half of the county of representation for four years and this carries right on up the stream all the way to yeah. the other. Well I do hear your I do hear your point. And it is it is um, as if when one party dominates an area then often the primary becomes the equivalent of the general uh, election. A lot of counties have gone to nonpartisan uh, is it nonpartisan yes. here? We have thanks to this man. Okay, well there we go. Okay, so what, so uh, the, the vision you had uh, to promote uh, nonpartisan uh, primaries means anyone could have jumped in to, to and in, in essence, the kind of the party label was uh, ideally stripped away. Now in practice, that kind of doesn't necessarily happen. Uh, but that's that's partly the answer. But let me tell you about a kind of a little. Let me expand on your question. Uh, when I was first around the Senate, I was an intern for Senator Hatfield, as the mayor noted in her introduction. And the, uh, the senators largely could disagree uh, without diminishing each other. Uh, they had fought in World War II together. They had been in the foxhole together. Uh, there was a bond. We were on the same side. Even if we disagree, we are on the same side. Uh, in addition, they lived in D.C. They had a normal work week. They were there most of the evenings. They often returned to their district one weekend a month. Uh, the families reinforced those relationships. Uh, so you had that, and you also had three networks that created kind of a common conversation among American citizens. That is not the world we live in today. Uh, Congress is in session from Monday night through Thursday night. Uh, people work day and night for three days, jump back on the plane. I come back to Oregon uh, every weekend. No point in staying in D.C. because nobody else is there. As so you, you come back to your, your district, the families are back home. I took my family to D.C. when I was first elected. Because that families used to be part of what the magic of what made Congress work. But after a year in which there were no other families there, I said, well, you know, my son's starting high school. They come back and get their roots uh, here in Oregon, which they, which they, which they did. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the networks are long past being the major source of, of news, social media, the, the, the web, the emails, uh, uh, blogging, uh, you name it. Uh, and because a lot of it's anonymous, it's a much more vicious environment. Uh, there is a um, tremendous number of pseudo facts put out by all sides, by all parties, reinforcing their points. It becomes harder to sort out, kind of filter out what's true and what isn't. Uh, that makes it more complicated. It's, all those things are designed to drive up the emotions. So now it starts to feel like warfare between the, the parties. I was very struck in the Senate. What I saw is uh, I was working with a, a senator on a, on a project across the aisle, and uh, then uh, Bob Bennett lost his primary in Utah. He was attacked for working with Senator Wyden on health care. And then Dick Luger lost his primary election in Indiana. He was attacked for working with John Kerry to control nuclear weapons. Uh, and suddenly, my partner on this project said, Jeff, I believe in the issue but I can't be seen working with a Democrat. And that's the type of additional polarization that has, has happened, which is making uh, common sense problem solving more difficult to achieve. And so as you said, it goes up the channel. Uh, it is a big challenge we have in America, and it's further complicated by the question that was raised earlier over campaign finance. So It, it, it violates four sections of the Oregon Constitution. It violates Amendment 1 and Amendment 14 of the U.S. Constitution, and so if it, if it violates those, how can they be legal? And when you say they, you mean the primary elections? Beg pardon? You're saying the, the primary it's elections? The primary elections. Again, I'm not speaking as a lawyer, but uh, in terms of the courts adjudicating the issue, they did not agree that it violated the American Constitution. But you sound like somebody who can educate me further on issues you've delved into, so let's uh, have Amy uh, follow up and uh, I'll learn a little bit. Just for one section of the Oregon, all the elections shall be free and equal. 
they can't be free and easy. <laughs> well, we're going to turn to our. Uh, uh, well, I'll learn some more about how the courts have interpreted that that phrase. Thank you for. We're going to close. You're welcome. We're going to close. I'm sorry. You can come up to me afterwards. Uh, but I'm going to close with uh, uh, our student uh, Anna, or is it Anna or Anna? Yeah. Anna. Uh, Anna uh, is at Lakeview High School, uh, a senior, and where are you planning to go to school next year? Oregon State University. And um, uh, so, uh, as a Kai is going there as well, is a fair share of your graduating class headed off to OSU? Maybe. Maybe, who knows? <laughs> It's still early in the school year to figure this sort of thing uh, uh, out. I'm sure sometime soon you'll be you'll be like, oh, I've got to get my application in. Oh, I've already applied. Already done. <laughs> All right. Um, well, um, would you like to close out with your comment or question? Uh, what are your thoughts concerning how to uh, keep college or make it more affordable in general, and what is uh, Congress doing? keep the interest rates on federal student loans low? So let me mention uh, three approaches. Uh, one is I've been uh, teaming up with Elizabeth Warren, saying that our students should get the same low interest rate that the big banks get when they borrow from the federal government. Big difference between paying 8 or 10 percent and paying 2 percent. Huge difference. Uh, second of all, I put forward a bill called the Afford Act. And uh, this, the roots of this started here in Oregon the state legislature has said, let's explore this idea called pay it forward, in which we have a revolving fund that pays the public school tuition for our, our high school students, and then they pledge to donate a share of their salary over the next 10 or 20 years back to that fund to pay for the next generation. Uh, that pay it forward concept uh, I explored thoroughly. We spent uh, a year just immersed in meeting with uh, groups. And in the end, it just, it's too complicated. Uh, and so, but there is a closely related idea uh, called income adjusted repayment on loans. And what it means is that when you borrow under a conventional loan, instead of having a payment that has X amount per month for 10 years, instead it's either X amount per month or after a basic survival income, 10% of your discretionary income. And uh, then if you haven't paid it off, after 20 years, the rest of the loan is forgiven. And what that means is that a student who would sign up for that vision uh, would know that they'd never be crushed by student debt because it'd never be more than 10% of your discretionary income. And this fear of being crushed by student debt is a really big factor uh, here in America. Uh, I live in a blue-collar community, the same community I grew up in. I can tell you the conversation among a lot of parents is, I'm sorry, son and daughter, we don't think we'll be able to afford for you to go to college. That is a message that really hurts our nation. It hurts the prospects for that student. They're going to probably uh, take a different course in high school if they hear that message, because what's the point? There's no future to pursue their, their, their dreams. Uh, the, um, not only is it bad for them, but because they don't fulfill their potential, society doesn't benefit from them fulfilling their potential. It's bad for all of us. Now, I uh, benefited from uh, parents who said, we didn't go to college. I was the first in my family to go to college. <coughs> my parents said, uh, we didn't go to college. We hope you do, and we're saving money so it'll be possible. And I just always believed it would be affordable. I never really knew anything about the financing. I just took it, okay, there's a, there's a path. I just believed there was a path. We need for that belief to be in place for every student <coughs> in America. And so the idea behind my bill is that if we have this as a premier option for the Stafford loan system for being able to attend a public university, then every student would know, could be told in seventh grade, junior high, there is an affordable path for you to get college education and have that be real, not just a wish. Uh, for we know this makes a difference because there is a foundation in which people adopt first graders and they pledge to finance a college education for everybody in that first grade class. And we have been able to study the results in schools of here's a classroom that was adopted, here's a classroom that was not adopted. The kids who were adopted by uh, wealthy donors, uh, they are told from that first grade, you can afford to go to college because of this program. 
they end up graduating at a much higher rate from high school, going to college at a much higher rate, graduating from college at a much higher rate, because of that knowledge that there is that, that path. So uh, that's uh, uh, the Afford Act. Uh, Senator Wyden has an act called the Partnership Act. Uh, it is an effort to say states need to control rising tuition. <coughs> and if the state undertakes to cap their tuition or to reduce it by putting more funds into their university system, the federal government will match that. Uh, and so that's another strategy to try to take on, because there's nothing has gone up faster in the American economy than the cost of college education. And yet nothing has become more important over time. There are pathways outside of college, there's career technical education, there's, there's trades, but a lot of jobs, a lot of visions do require that additional education, more so than a generation ago. So we need to make it uh, uh, a, a, a pathway that people see that it is available. I was struck by comparing the numbers in Germany to the United States. In Germany, the cost of tuition at a, at, a, at a public university is equal to 4% of median income. So $1 out of every 25, or 4 to 5%, $1 out of every 25. A family can pay the tuition out of the current year income, basically. Most families can. In America, it's not 4 to 5% of, of median income. It's 45% of median income. Families you cannot save $1 out of every two in a, in a year. Uh, college here, college is affordable in Germany, it's not affordable here. That's the bottom line, we've got to change that. Is that helpful? Thank you. That's a good question for us to, to close on. I want to thank very much the mayor for uh, uh, having us here in town and, and uh, emceeing the, the gatherings. Uh, appreciate all of you being engaged citizens uh, and engaged in this kind of this dialogue. Uh, don't let this dialogue stop with this. I'm sure some of you send me letters. Feel free to continue that. And through Amy, she can also get us on the, on the phone together or pursue the issues you're working on. Uh, so thank you very much. It's an honor to serve as your Senator.